have been doing a series for the summer on greats in the Bible, and uh, we're going to continue with that series, but today is the last Sunday of the greats. And uh, today we're going to deal with great fear. We talked about great salvation, great boldness, great indwelling. We talked, this is like the tenth in this series that we're going to, there are far more number of greats in the Bible than these. These are just the ones that uh, God put on my heart. And all of them are very uplifting, if you ask me, but the one today I find is not as uplifting as it is challenging. Challenging. Great fear. Great fear. Hey, guys, uh, you're going to have to do something back there. It's not advancing. There we go. Fear. I've got the Greek word up there, phobos, and phobos we get the word phobia from. How many have ever heard that word, phobia? <laughs> all right, yeah. Uh, and uh, Webster defines a phobia as an exaggerated, usually inexplicable and illogical fear of a particular object, class of objects, or situation. I went online and there's all kinds of websites that have uh, the different kinds of phobias. As best I can tell, there's over 200 categories, probably even more than that. You've all heard of claustrophobia, right? Anybody ever been in an MRI machine? Oh, a little claustrophobic, are you? Just a tad bit. Claustrophobia, fear of those closed in tight places. Uh, how about on an elevator? Or uh, have, how many have been like to the top of an extremely tall building? Uh, I've been on the top of the World Trade Center back when it was around. And on the very, very top. How many have ever been on one of those? How many would not go up there if we paid you a million dollars? Okay, there we go. We got a few hands. You know, there's that, uh, that uh, fear of high places. There's all kinds of fears. Fear of flying. There, there's a, a, a fear of, you name it, a fear of going on a cruise ship because it's out in the middle of the ocean and you can't swim. A fear of water, fear of drowning. There's, there's fears, there are all these phobias. Fear, 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 fear. The, the most unusual one I, I picked up was, I, I picked up a track on being afraid, being fearful of fear itself. I'm afraid that I'm going to be afraid. And some of you are saying, I relate. <laughs> I relate. I got you there. I know what you're talking about. Fear, 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 fear. Those are phobias. Phobias, okay? 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Phobia. But of power and love and a sound mind. Phobia, that over-exaggerated, what-if kind of fear is not prompted by God. It's not. It comes from somewhere other than the Spirit of God. Wow. Christians should be the least fearful people on the planet because what is the worst that could happen to me today is that I could die. And what's the Bible say? To be with Christ is far better. So we should be the least phobia kind of people on the planet. We should be. We should be. Now, <clears throat> there is, however, a healthy fear. There's a healthy fear. That one was very unhealthy, but the Bible talks about a very healthy fear, and it says this in Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The starting place for us is to have a fear of the Lord, and it is the same word in the New Testament, phobia. It's the same phobia. It's a fear of God Almighty, but the, the meaning is it that it's over-exaggerated and taking control of my life and preventing me from doing things that I ought to normally do. This fear is a profound respect. You see, not all fear is unhealthy. If you have a fear of fire, it's good. When I was a boy, I saw at a family picnic, one of the coals from the barbecue had fallen out, the charcoal. And it was white, and I thought I'd think anything of it. So I went over to pick it up and throw it back in. Guess what? I got the fear of white coal. <laughs> Profound respect. Now I would take a stick and push it. Why? I have, a, I have a healthy fear. I have a profound respect that hurt could come. We live with healthy fear every day. 
I would imagine that at least 99.9%, .9%, if not 100% of the people here, when you get in the car, you put on your seat belt. Why do you do that? You are having a fearful, a good, healthy fear or respect, profound respect, that my driving skills could lead me to an accident. <laughs> and that could save my life, all right? Or you have a healthy fear that the flashing lights might go on and you get pulled over and on top of your speeding ticket, get another $100 ticket for not having your seatbelt on. <laughs> Those are all healthy fears. They're healthy fears. I want to focus on the healthy fear because the Bible says this in Acts chapter 5. Great fear. Great fear. And if I were to uh, put this uh, in, in the way the Greek has it, it has phobos mega. If I flip them around, that's the way we do it in English. Mega phobos, mega phobia. Mega phobia! That's what it says. Megaphobia seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Why did it? Why did it seize them all? Here's why. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I really wish that we were like the early church and we had the fear of the Lord grip us because it would motivate us to live quite differently than we do. So I want to explore this a little bit. Nadab and Abihu discovered that great fear of the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 10, it says in verse 1, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers and they filled them and they added incense. Uh, they put fire in them and they added incense and they offered, and here it is, unauthorized fire before the Lord contrary to his command. They disobeyed God. You know what we call that? Sin. They sinned. But this was huge because this is the inauguration day of the tabernacle and God is wanting them to, he's just instructed them in detail how to do everything right. And instead of taking the fire from the, the brazen altar and putting it in their censer, they took it from somewhere else. They violated the will of the Lord. And this is what the text says, and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. Poof! They were toast. <laughs> I know that's a pun. But they were. The Lord's fire went out from them, consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said, this is what the Lord spoke. Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. Don't you dare desecrate the Lord. Wow. I will show myself holy in the sight of the people I will be honored. You're not to do that in my presence. God at any moment, this God that says he, he's, a, he's a fire and that, that he's an all-consuming fire and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. At any time, <clears throat> he can intrude in time and space with his judgment and consume anyone he wants. Thank God for his mercy and his grace. Because I'd have been torched long ago. I'm a sinner just as they are. Wow. <clears throat> Achan also discovered <clears throat> this same fear of the Lord. In Joshua chapter 7. We've been over this in the past. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. You see, God told them, when you destroy Jericho, I'm going to destroy it for you. You're going to march around the city seven times on that last day of your marching. <clears throat> the walls are going to come down. You're going to go up and you're going to seize them and you're going to slaughter all the people. You're going to save Rahab and her family because God had promised that he would do that. And you are to destroy all the things that are in the city. It's wholly devoted to the Lord. It's all mine. And, and I'm using it all as a sacrifice. I'm going to do, destroy it all. But one person, it says Achan, he took some of those things. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. So the men went up and they spied out all of AI and the next town that they were supposed to take. 
but they were routed by the little town Ai. I hear they couldn't, they, they beat the big city of Jericho, but couldn't beat this little tiny town Ai. And it says, and the Lord said to Joshua, Israel has sinned. What do you mean? Eight can one guy sinned? The whole nation crumbles. Israel has sinned. They have taken some of the devoted things that belong to the Lord. They have stolen from God. God says they're mine and I just want to destroy them. <clears throat> and he's taken some of those. They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. Early the next morning on God's instruction, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes. <clears throat> God had said he was going to point, point out the tribe, the family, right down to the individual. <clears throat> and Achan, the son of Carney, was taken, and then the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah, and he was taken. And it, it, it kept bringing him, and yep, this is the guy, this, 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 this. And finally, it gets down to Achan, and they ask Achan, why did he do this? He said, it is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. He's confessing it. He's laying it out there. I saw the plunder. I coveted the plunder. I took the plunder. And I hid the plunder. Boy, this is the same thing we do. We see something. We covet it. We take it. Then afterward, we know we can't show it, so we bury it and we hide it. And where does he hide it? Right in the midst of his own tent. He's living in it. And then they said, hey, here they are. They're hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So there it was, hidden in his tent. And Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned him, uh, stoned the rest and his family, they burned them. Listen, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is not a popular, uh, mm, what would I say, uh, seeker-sensitive kind of sermon. Did you gather that by now? It's not a feel-good sermon. But sometimes we need the fear of God Almighty to drive us to our knees so that we confess our sin. Hmm. We come to Acts chapter 5 in the New Testament. Those are Old Testament. We come to Acts chapter 5. This is the context in which the passage we're looking at, the great mega fear takes place. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. See, they were taking out, everybody was bringing money to the church uh, in order to help those who were poor. And they're bringing their money. And it says, with his wife's full knowledge, Ananias kept back a part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Here's how it was going down. They had promised to give so much. But then when they sold the property, they held back and didn't give it all like they said they would. And so they're keeping some back because it's like, well, man, I promised too much. <laughs> and so this is what happened. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you lied to the Holy Spirit? Wow. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I say, well, hey, wait a minute, Pastor. I was here when it says, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world, and that Satan cannot indwell you. That's right, he cannot, but he can influence you. And the word here, filled, is one of the occasions where we know that the word fill, it means to take control of, you allow to take control of. So when the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's saying you give full control over to the Holy Spirit. Here it says he was filled. He had filled, Satan filled his heart. He gave control over to Satan to lie to the Holy Spirit. And you have kept yourself some of the money that you received for the land that you promised to sell the land and give the money to the church. But instead you sold the land and you kept it back. You lied. You lied to the Holy Spirit. Did it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men. Here's the catch. 
but you lied to God. To lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God, because the Holy Spirit is God. You lied to God. Remember this? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And here's his verse. And megaphobia, mega fear, the good kind, seized all who heard what had happened. The fear of God Almighty. They learned from Ananias. Then the young men came forward and they wrapped up his body and they carried him out and they buried him. Three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, comes in, not knowing what has happened to her husband. And Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you, you and Ananias had got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Of course, the price that he named was the amount minus what they kept. <laughs> and she said, yes, that's what we sold it for. And Peter said, how could you have agreed to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Verse 10, the very next verse, 11, we find it here twice, verse 5 and verse 11. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. If we were taking up the offering and you told, sold something and um, you had told us how much you sold it for and it wasn't the exact amount, but you had promised to give it to God and you came forward and were taking up the offering and you fell dead, everybody else in the congregation would be very careful of what they said. God doesn't always operate this way, but he does from time to time intrude, like with Achan, like, like Ananias and Sapphira. He intrudes in space and time, like Nadab and Abihu. He intrudes, and he gives immediate judgment instead of holding off judgment to the judgment day. Wow. If we had a sense of how holy and how fearful it is to fall into the hands of a living God, I think we would all live a little differently. We'd be praying for more people's salvation than for my little ailments, right? Man, I wish the fear of the Lord would grip us as a church. So what is this really about? What is this all really about? I want to suggest that the Lord's disciplining his children is what this is really about. I've often said the key to disciplining your kids is getting the bluff in early. If you spank them when they're small and you don't have to hit very hard, you don't really don't. You can put a pillow on the end and hit them. Because it's more your voice and the object, and, and, and somehow they relate the discipline to the object and not to you, and then you can love them afterward. If you get the bluff in earlier, later you can just say, hey, you better settle down, or I'm going to land on you. My dad, one time we were running through the state capitol in Jefferson City, Missouri, running through the capitol building. My dad yelled at me and said, hey, you better stop running, or I'll put a knot on your head so big you can't carry it. I stopped running. Why? The bluff was in. He wasn't about to do that, but I thought he was, right? These occasions I just gave you were at the beginning of something important, the beginning of the tabernacle, worship, the beginning of taking the new land with Achan, the start of the church. God is saying, listen, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm capable of doing. I don't normally operate this, but I want you to understand at any time I can intrude in time and I can discipline my people, I can do that. Wow. Wow. So I want to talk about some examples of discipline. I'm jumping from our passage. These are kind of topical sermons. We're jumping around in the Bible. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about verbal discipline. And you have, he says, and you have forgotten what the word 
of encouragement that addresses you as sons. And then he quotes from Proverbs chapter 3, My sons, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. That's one of the forms of discipline, you get rebuked. That's what my father was doing when he told me he was going to put a knot on my head so big I can't carry it. <laughs> he was rebuking me for my behavior. He said, listen, discipline, is there's verbal discipline. And he goes on and he says, and there's loving discipline. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. I'm in the grocery store and some other parent's kid's acting up. Do I go over and discipline that kid? No way. Not mine. My kid acts up, I thump him. <laughs> hey, get in line, you know? Why? My son. I love my son. I don't want my son that I love to behave that way. That's what he says. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Listen, if, if the Lord loves you, you're going to be disciplined because we're all sinners. We're sinners, saved by grace. And he punishes every son, he, everyone he accepts as a son. Listen, <clears throat> you're going to get to paddling every now and then when you get out of line. That's just the fact of life. It's the way it works. If you're loved by God, that is true. Listen, it's hard discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. He's going to go on and talk about how it, it seems really hard at the time. It's hard. Paddlings are not easy. I used to say, well, you know what, I'm not... I may be hard of hearing, but I'm not deaf. You don't have to use the two-by-four on me. <laughs> right? Discipline seems hard at times. He says, listen, it's fatherly discipline. Fathers need to discipline their kids. Listen to this. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. If you have no discipline from God in your life, you're not His. So you need to look and say, what is God? How is he disciplining me? I want, I want to know if I'm a Christian. Then you better have some discipline in your life. For what son is not disciplined by his earthly father? Come on. No, father discipliners. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate. Your DNA doesn't match God's DNA. You're not a child of God. Wow. You're illegitimate children. You're not true sons. If there's no godly discipline in your life, whoa, then you need to say, am I truly a Christian? Am I truly a Christian? Have I been born again? Am I in the family of God? He goes on and says, it's respectful discipline. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who discipline us and we respect them. I love my father. I had the greatest father on earth. There's only one person in here that would, uh, would, say about, would agree with me on that. And that's my brother who's here. <laughs> we had the greatest father on earth. That's just the way it is. And we had a paddling. We had a board. And I said, you know, we used to sign it when we got whacked. I don't know if you did that when you were the firstborn. I don't know if firstborn ever signed it, but later we were kind of bragging rights. Who had gotten the most whacks? You always preferred to get them from mom because mom, they were really soft. But when you got hit by my dad, you knew you were hit. <laughs> Listen, he said, and we respect him. I love my father. My father is the greatest man on earth. Why? He disciplined me. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? God, our father, disciplines us. But he says this, our, our fathers discipline us for a little while as they thought best. That's my earthly father. My dad, he disciplined me for what, I, what he thought best. I did the same. I would discipline my kids because they just got too noisy and I couldn't think. Here I'm working on my message in the other room. They're fighting in the other room. I go in and I discipline them. Why? Because it was bothering me. It wasn't for their advantage. That's the way he said, hey, listen. And we still respect them. But he said, God disciplines us for our good. He never does it out of anger. He does it when we're a child of God. He's wanting us to grow what? That we might share in his holiness. You know what holiness is? Holiness means to be set apart from all that is bad, all that is evil. God sets us apart. If you've been disciplined by the Lord, he's saying, don't be like the world. Don't be like the children of Satan. He's saying, listen, I've set you apart. Be like my kid. 
Do what I want you to do. Be holy, for I am holy. Then he says, it's always productive. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. I never thought it was, just, it was pleasant at the time. And I'm, I'm glad my dad never lied and said, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> my dad never said that. I mean, I knew it didn't hurt him as much as it was hurting me. <laughs> Listen, he said, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, produces a harvest of righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? It's doing the right things. Doing the right things. He disciplined me. It hurt like crazy. But the produce of that was later, I didn't do the wrong thing anymore. I did the right thing. Righteousness. And peace. Because I'm doing the right thing, I'm at peace with my Father. You see what's going on here? For those who have been, been trained by it, you've been trained by it, it produces in you a harvest. So I got this big heart. Man, man, it, it, it's just a harvest of, of right things in a person's life. You let a child go and the child will do the wrong thing and will get a habit of doing the wrong thing, will always do the wrong thing. You'll always do the wrong thing. So I want to talk in the remaining amount of time about the path of discipline. There is a path. The first thing I think that you get in the path of discipline is a conviction. You are convicted. Deep down inside, there is a conviction. When the Holy Spirit, the counselor, Jesus is speaking here in John 16, says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt. Now, guilt means that I have an obligation to satisfy justice. So he is going to convict me of being guilty. I must satisfy justice. So it means I did something wrong and I must pay. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts us of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. In regard to sin, he says in the next verse, because men do not believe, they reject Jesus. There was a day when I was just an eight-year-old boy and the Holy Spirit pricked my conscience so that I realized I was not a believer. I didn't accept Christ. I was not a Christian. It was the Holy Spirit that was convicting me and my conscience that I was a sinner in need of the Savior. He says, in regard of righteousness, because I am going to the Father where, I, where you can see me no longer. I'm going to the Father, that makes me righteous. What it's talking about is that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid in full for our sins. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it says that he, was, he died on account of our sin and was raised on account of our righteousness because he secured the righteousness. He is the righteous one. He's returned to the Father. And so the idea here is he convicts me that I am a sinner and Jesus is the righteous one, and I need the righteous one to save me. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Listen, if the devil is going to be condemned, and I'm a child of the devil, then I'm going to be condemned too. And so he convicts me, oh, if I don't receive Christ as my Savior, I'm going to be in perdition forever and ever and ever and ever. Whoa. Whoa. It starts with a conviction of the Holy Spirit. The second thing it moves to, if you're not responding to the conviction of, of God and he convicts you by deep down inside, that inner voice, your conscience, that, and your conscience is that part of you that measures what you're doing or saying or thinking or feeling as good or bad. It's a judgment on your own actions and your state of being. That conscience, he pricks it. If you ignore that, I believe the next phase is he works in the circumstances of your life. He disciplines you through circumstances. He did Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He was supposed to go to Nineveh. Tarshish was completely 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And he went the opposite way. When God is telling you to do something and you won't do it, you just say, no, I'm not doing that, God. He's going to use circumstances to discipline you. Then the Lord sent a great wind. Jonah got on the boat. He's going to Tarshish. He's out in the Mediterranean Sea. Such a violent storm that arose that the ship was threatened to break. And the sailors were afraid. But Jonah, uh, he was running from God. He went down below the deck. 
And he lay down and fell asleep. You know something here I find really strange? He has peace with running from God. He thinks everything's just fine and okay. You know, we can convince ourselves, oh, things are going pretty good because I'm not doing what God wants me to do. It's okay, I kind of like this. It's going to be short-lived. There is pleasure in sin for a season. It's seasonal. It's going to come to an end. The sailors were so upset over it. Each one, they said, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. I don't think they used straws. They probably used stones. We call it, hey, he got the short straw. Jonah got the short straw. They cast lot, and the lot fell on Jonah. You see what's going on? God is using circumstance. Jonah flees. Storm arises at sea. God uses nature. Then they cast lots, randomness, chance. There is no chance. God is providentially running his universe. You know, the reason I haven't won the lotto, well, you've got to play first of all. But even if I played and I didn't win the lotto, it's because God providentially didn't let me win the lotto. There's no chance. The cat, they cast the lot and it fell on Jonah. And so they ask him, tell us, well, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? This trouble. And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And he goes on, he talks a little bit more, and uh, he's confessing. And they said, ask him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? He said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Well, then I skip several verses there that they tried to lighten the ship and all of that. And then it says, but finally, they said, it storms worse. They took Jonah and threw him overboard in a raging sea calmed. But you know, this did something. At that, the men, here's my key word, they greatly feared. You know what? They learned the lesson from Jonah. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's why we got the Bible. We read the Bible, we learn the lessons from them, and we then live our lives according to what God intruded with his justice in time and space. We live our lives differently. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. What? These were pagan guys, now they're worshiping. And they made vows to the Lord. God, I'm on your side now. And the Lord provided a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Oh my goodness, this is great. He's still being disciplined. In the second chapter, he prays from the belly of the great fish that God had prepared. And at the end of this prayer of confession, the fish spits out Jonah on the dry land, and that's why I got a picture of him up here. He's, he's been spit out, and he goes and he preaches to Nineveh. God had a way of using circumstances to bring his erring child back to him. If you are a child of God, you will be disciplined. It's just the way it is. Third way that God, you, you ignore God's conviction, you ignore the circumstances going on, a man ought to examine himself. Oh, this is when we do the Lord's Supper. I read this passage almost once a month here at church. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. He said, they were abusing the Lord's Supper table, so Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians on instructions about it, and he's saying, God will discipline you here, and he calls it judgment. You, you need to recognize the Lord's body and what you're doing and not treat the Lord's Supper, just trivialize it. He's saying, because if you don't, judgment will come upon you. He goes on and describes the judgment. He says, this is why, that is why many among you are weak. You're run down. You have no energy. You're, you're taking all these energy drinks because you just run down. It reminds me of the story of Samson. Remember the story of Samson? He abused the Nazarite vow, and he, he told Delilah, oh yeah, just bind me with you know, bow strings, and then he broke him off. He told her, oh, use fresh ropes, broke him off. He said, oh, all you got to do is braid my hair, and he got up and he took off. And he said, cut my hair. He violated the vow that he was under before God, and all of a sudden his energy was gone. He was a weak man weak man. Why? He desecrated the thing that God had called him to do, and he had no strength. He was weak. Not until his hair grew back, and not until he confessed his sin, and asked for the Lord to use him again, his strength returned, and phew, he pushed those pillars, and the house came down. 
Sometimes Christians are weak as a form of discipline. Now, I'm not saying every time you're weak it's a form of discipline from God. We had to walk the talk out here. And after we walked around for a little while, I sat down. Others like Josh and Emma, they kept going. In fact, they're still running. I'm exhausted. Why? I'm just out of shape. That weakness was not necessarily a discipline from the Lord. I'm just fatigued from doing it. What I'm trying to say is you can't judge somebody else. Only you know what God is convicting you of. Only you know that those circumstances are because you're disobedient to the Lord. You know that. The Spirit of God is working in your heart. Only you know if you're weak because you're disobedient to the Lord. Nobody else knows between you and God. Many of you are sick. He says, that's why many among you are weak and many of you are sick. When Jesus saw that Peter's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, he touched her hand and the fever left her. He healed her. You read the Gospel accounts, he healed so many people. This brings me to a passage in the New Testament in the book of James. It says, as anyone among you sick, he should call for the elders of the church. I think a lot of people would, be a far, would have much more rapid healing if they heeded this part right here. If you're sick, you would call. You don't call. You know how I know? Because I'm the elder of the church. You don't say, hey, come and pray over me. That's what the text says. It starts with you calling, saying, I need help. Pray for me. He says here, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him. And that's what I do. I go to the hospital and I pray. Why? Usually because I found out through the grapevine and I show up and you're surprised. And I pray over you. But if you'd call, you'd be making this thing complete. You call and he prays over you. And and then the text says, and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the anointing oil, the word here for anoint is alepho. It is not the Greek word Christos. Christos is a ceremonial anointing. Like you would anoint a king or a priest. You'd pour oil on their head. This anointing is... uh, not Christos, but a lepho, which is used like a medicine. It's kind of like, because oil, oil was, the, was the kind of medicine that they used in the day. And so it's kind of like, pray over him and apply the medicine in the name of the Lord. So what do I do? I come to the hospital, I pray over you, and I ask God to use the doctors, the technicians, the medication, the surgery, and I go down the whole list. Uh, everybody, God, use them in the name of the Lord. I say, make this successful. Why? It's fulfilling this passage. And notice what it goes on to say, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. <laughs> Isn't that great? I, I want you to notice something. It doesn't say the anointing oil, the medicine. The Lord is the one who makes the person well. I include that in my prayers almost. And if, you, if, I, if I visited you in the hospital, you know I, I pray this. I pray that, Lord, with all the wonderful things that they can do with the medicines, technology, and all the rest, they cannot make the body heal. Only you can do that, Lord. Only you can do that, Lord. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And then there's this big, if he has sinned. He will be forgiven. It's not because he has sinned. You're not sick because you have sinned. But if sin, if if this is one of those disciplinary measures, God is disciplining you by being sick. If he has sinned, it will be forgiven him. Remember Jesus when he healed the paralytic? And he said, your sins be forgiven you. And oh, all the Pharisees got all up in arms because he said, uh, Jesus says he can forgive sin. And he said, which is easier for me to say, your sins be forgiven you, or rise, take up your bed and walk. And he told the man, take up your bed and walk. He got up and walked. To prove to the fact that he had the power to forgive the sins. He goes on and says, therefore, you see, he, he, he breaks the chains, Jesus does. He gives us forgiveness. He releases us with the sickness. He said, therefore, he says, confess to each other and pray to each other, so that, uh, pray, uh, pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's the word healed. 
The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Listen, the last form of discipline is sleep or death. That is why many among you are weak, sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Jesus told the disciples, he said, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up, he'll be fine. And he said, no, no, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For the believer, death is nothing more than a sleep. The body has died, but the spirit goes to be with Christ, and the body is going to be awakened or resurrected at the time of the rapture and be with Christ. We're going to talk about this in First John. I'm going to skip over it, but I just want to do this. We are never condemned. Never condemned. If we judge ourselves, it says in 1 Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. And when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, not condemned. We are being disciplined. You will never be judged by the Lord. You will be disciplined by the Lord. Your judgment is discipline, not punishment. They will not be condemned with the world. Listen, since we have now been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, how much more will we be saved from God's wrath through him? If you have accepted Christ, you've experienced discipline in your life of conviction, circumstances, weakness, a sickness, or even died because you have been disobedient to the Lord and said, I'm taking you home prematurely, I'm taking you with me, you will still never experience the wrath of God because it's all been taken by Jesus Christ on the cross. And when you accepted Christ as Savior, he took all your condemnation, all your punishment, all your wrath away. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a great place to be? Whoa. I want you to take this with you today. My time's run out, and I'm so sorry about that, but replace your unhealthy phobias with a healthy fear of the Lord. That's what you need to do. Listen, just remember, God's discipline means I'm in God's family. I'm a child of God. When you are convicted, because I'm a child of God. Listen, when my circumstances aren't going right and I know that I'm way, he's doing this because I'm a child of God. He's disciplining me. He loves me. Listen, if I'm weak and I know, I've been ignoring it and I'm saying, God, God loves me so much. He's doing this for me. He loves me. Listen, if you've got sickness, whatever it is, always remember, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But he loves you enough to discipline you. You see why great fear sieged the whole church and all who heard about these events? Whoa, they serve the true and living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, of all the greats that we've covered, this one is the most challenging. It speaks right into our hearts and our lives and some here are, are probably think, I don't know that I've ever been disciplined. And then they need to ask, am I a child of God? Lord, make me your child, I accept you. Others are saying, well, wow, it's starting to make sense. Why this, 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 and this happened? Because I'm a child of God and you're disciplining me. And we know, Lord, all of this is for our holiness, to make us more like you, to be holy as you are holy. And so today, Lord, we pray we'd be very mindful that it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And Lord, that great, great fear would sweep through our church and to all who hear what you're doing in our midst. This I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us. Great are you, Lord.